Well, let's get started. So uh, again, thanks for joining us this evening for the Taste of Art program with Lehigh University Art Galleries and Art Bites. My name is Stacey Brennan. I'm the Curator of Education, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our program and to introduce our presenters this evening, Alicia Moore, Maite gomez Recon, and our featured restaurant partner, Christy Vimazal from The Flying V, Poutinery and Food Truck. Taste of Art is a free public program that combines mini art history lessons with live cooking demonstrations. The program spotlights local Southside restaurants to celebrate and build awareness of the community's eclectic, historic, and diverse urban culture. Each workshop pairs a work of art from Lehigh's art collection with a related recipe from the featured restaurant to highlight the diverse cultures and voices that make up Bethlehem's Southside community. This program is brought through support from the Institute of Museum and Library Services through the American Rescue Plan grant. If you have not picked up your kit yet, a limited number of free kits are available for pickup at LUAG's main gallery and Zona Art Center, as well as at the Flying V starting on Wednesday when they open during their regular business hours. If you'd like us to put a kit aside for you, please email us at luag at lehigh.edu. As part of this grant funded program, participants are eligible to win gift certificates to local Southside restaurants. So please make sure you tag us and like us on social media after your participation in this program. And two winners from today's program will receive a gift certificate to the Flying Bay. Please note that this program is being recorded. We welcome you to participate in the conversation at any time by unmuting yourself or placing your comments or questions in the chat box. So now it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers for today. Alicia Moore is our new visitor services coordinator at Lehigh University Art Galleries, and we're very happy to have her on board. Alicia brings a lot of great experience from her time at Penn State Lehigh Valley, including interning there for the art galleries and at the Lehigh Valley Arts Council. Maite gomez Rejon is the founder of Art Bites, and for over a decade, Maite has been exploring the nexus of art and culinary history through lectures, cooking demos, classes, and tastings, and she's presented at museums and cultural centers across the country. She also just launched an exciting new podcast with Ava Longoria called Hungry for History, which can be found wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Together, Maite and Ava examine the origins of yummy entrees, ingredients, and drinks through their Mexican heritage. We highly recommend you checking it out. And owners, Matt and Christy, have been in the food truck business, owners of the Flying V, uh, Matt and Christy, have been in the food truck business since 2017 and the restaurant business since 2020. They, they met not too far from here at Kutztown during their undergrad. Once Christy moved to the state, she realized there was a lack of Canadian cuisine and there were few and far attempts uh, between, a few and far between attempts at the Canadian dishes always fell short. She, they decided together to recreate Canadian staples and we're gonna try one of them this evening, uh, the butter tart. Um, and the best way uh, she has done this is through including ingredients and family recipes to bring this, this cuisine to us in Bethlehem, PA. Christy, we're so happy to have you here this evening. I'd love to turn the mic over to you to tell us a little bit about the Flying Bee and how you got started sharing your passion for Canadian cooking and food with us. Sure, thank you so much for having me. Um, so you kind of heard the beginning part. I went to Kutztown University. Um, I played softball there um, and I met um, Matt there and he had some culinary background um, and I just really just missed home and missed some of the foods that I was used to eating. So he would make them at home for me and we took some time to, to really make them the right way um, because we would go out to eat at different restaurants and found that it just wasn't the same. <laughs> so we were kind of sick and tired of that and being disappointed. So we thought, why don't we just do it ourselves? And we'd love to be our own bosses and um, let's try it out. Let's start a food truck, but we couldn't afford the truck. So we, we just did a pop-up tent. So we we invested in a tent and then some equipment and a trailer and drove all around the Lehigh Valley, just setting up at breweries and festivals. And it was a lot of education. So it's, it's come a long way. It's, um, you know, Canada's not that far away. It's only from here about six and a half hours to the border, maybe less actually. It's a six and a half hour drive for me to get home about. So um, about five hours to the border probably. And 
So it's just funny to me that we're so close, but, but yet there's not a lot of presence of some of the Canadian staples, um, at least in the Lehigh Valley or at all in this country. So um, yeah, and it's all delicious things. So like poutine is one of our main things that we do, rice, cheese, curds, and gravy. Um, we thought that was going to be hard to package in a, <laughs> in a kit. So we went with the butter tart dessert instead. Um, but yeah, we opened the restaurant in 2020. Um, so during COVID, um, but it's been a wild ride. Um, it's really cool. One of the coolest things to see is um, starting out in the tent in the back of a brewery and just um, constantly getting, what is this? asked to us every single time and constantly having to explain what poutine is um, to now where people come into the shop and are very confidently ordering the exact flavor that they want. And we rarely get that question anymore. Is really, really cool to see. So that's in a nutshell, I guess, <laughs> where we started and how, where we are now. We had a question for you in the chat. Why the flying bee? Is that a reference to Canadian geese? Yes. Yeah, so actually one of the, we kind of had a, a moment when we were testing out recipes, we would bring friends and family over a lot and had them set up, um, you know, around our kitchen table and we would say like, okay, this is, this is poutine, this is Canadian, this is the pea meal bacon, what do you guys think of this, this flavor, the gravy versus this flavor, and we're all sitting there talking and we hadn't come up with a name yet, we didn't even have actually registered the business yet, but we were sitting there and we heard Canadian geese fly, like, um, the you know they're we've heard them flying overhead and we kind of just looked at each other and said flying v huh like canadian geese they fly south for the winter and our last name is vimazal so it kind of made sense the letter v and um we were also big fans of the mighty duck movie um so that, that played a factor so those three things mighty ducks canadian geese and our last name That's awesome. Thank you so much. We're so happy to have you here this evening and so grateful that you're sharing your family recipes with us. Um, and now we'll kick it over to Alicia, who's going to tell us a little bit about our featured artist this evening. All right. So our um, featured artist that we went with for this program was George Zimble. He is a American Canadian photographer. I was born in 1929. He is a, his career started um, back when he was only 14 years old, um, when he got his first camera and he began photograph um, photographing for the local newspaper and businesses in the New York area. He continued his love for photography um, into college and, where he actually went to Columbia University. And during that time there, he got his first cover um, shoot for Life Magazine. After college, he was sent to war, and while he was there, he produced a book of aerial and land photographer photography oof, um, of the Rhine River. Upon getting back from war, he came back to New York, and he began to embark in his career as a freelance photographer, and he took snapshots, included pics from the streets of New York, the neighborhoods, the children, and another big thing that he liked taking pictures of was nightclubs from Bourbon Street in New Orleans. Um, and he also ended up um, photographing some great um, people that very famous, um, like Harry Truman, JFK, Richard Nixon, and Marilyn Monroe. So um, the big thing about the Marilyn Monroe photographs that he took was it was during her iconic scene from the seven year itch where she was caught on the grate and her dress goes up, very iconic. He was there for that. He didn't take that exact picture, but he was there for, and took lots of candids of it that he didn't even look at until years later and realized how great they were. So, um, so that brings us to uh, about 1971, he moved hit him and his family for, um, from New York City to Prince Edward Island in Canada where he moved there for his biggest reason was to protest the Vietnam War. And Canada was a peaceful country at the time, and that's where he wanted his family to live and grow up. Um, they eventually ended up on what's called Bonafide Farm, 
which is actually where this photograph was taken of the puppy at the window. Um, this is right from their farm there in Canada. Um, and in 1977, he gained Canadian nationality. So from then on, he went by that. Um, he's always been interested in what is happening around him instead of creating something, something itself. He is quoted with saying, I find it more interesting to see what people are doing than creating something itself. Um, as it went on, his, um, he said, his images offer a completely subjective interpretation based on respect towards his subjects, the critical observation and the spontaneous actions around him. From living in New York City, he saw tons of stuff and just wanted to document everything he was seeing around him. Um, he wanted to demonstrate the simplicity, the elegance, and the charm of daily life that he said no longer existed in the world that he was seeing. Um, his poetic flair emerged from his um, photos has to do more with his own sensibility, which always helped him achieve balance between chance and the ambigu ambiguity of life. This is um, the very same sensibility combined with his extraordinary social awareness that oriented him towards photographing projects related to the fields of architecture or education away from the established um, commercial paths. And he always stayed true to that. He was very, um, he always made sure that his subjects were very natural. Um, and actually in 2001, um, he was given a Lifetime Achievement Award of the Canadian Photographers in Communications. In 2005, he was inducted into the Royal Canadian Can Academy of Arts. Um, in 2016, a feature film-length documentary about him called Zimbalism premiered at the Docs Festival in Toronto, and it was a finalist for the Audience Choice Award. Um, it's a great film. You get a chance to watch it. Um, very awesome how he went about his work. Um, unfortunately, George Zimbel did die um, actually just this year in January, but he leaves behind a great legacy of the photographs of what he called a simpler time. And with that, <laughs> Um, I hope you all enjoyed it. I'm going to send it over to Mate and she's going to start working on your recipe. Thank you. Thank you all so much. I'm, I'm, I love this program. So I'm so excited to, to be here with you. Um, and when we met about this, um, I was very excited when Christy suggested the butter tart. And um, there were a couple of suggested recipes and they were, they were both sweets, which spoke directly to my heart um, because I have a horrible sweet tooth but or amazing sweet tooth, however you want to call it. But um, so what I would, how many of you have, um, are cooking along with us today? Is anybody? I'm curious because I don't see any, everybody's camera's off. So, oh, there's one, Christine. Yay. <laughs> and Stacy. Oh, Ashley. Oh, fantastic. So there are a few of you. Great. So, so what I'll do today, if those of you, for those of you that might be here for the first time, um, I will go into the history of the butter tart. And oh, Lisa, you forgot the eggs. No worries. There, there's you can always make it later. Yeah. Um, and then once the butter tarts are in the oven, I will make the cocktail. Usually I start with the cocktail, but since we have, you know, to let them bake. Um, I'll make the cocktail sort of in between. And I love this idea, you know, I'm both, you know, Christy, you were talking about, you know, your family and missing home and this whole idea of, of home and recipes and what they represent, you know, to to one, like the things that we miss, um, the things that sort of define us and they become part of our identities. And I, and I love this. Um, so I had never heard of butter tarts before. I have a, a good friend who's one of my neighbors. She was over yesterday 
and um, and I she brought actually a bottle of Canadian whiskey. Not this. We didn't drink this yesterday. I had this, but she brought another bottle of Canadian whiskey. Um, she's Canadian, and I told her that I was making butter tarts today, and she was like, "What?" What? She was so excited. Um, so I know exactly where I'm going after this class to drop off these butter tarts. But um, this whole idea of sort of cookbooks and recipes. Oh, actually, for those of you that are cooking along, preheat your oven to 425. Um, and also, Alicia, um, looking at, you know, the, of his, his work, it's also sort of about home and about values and sort of all of those things that that come together. And it's I mean, I love this, that we're making a, a tart that is so simple. It's basically eggs and sugar and flour and butter. Um, and that's basically, you know, it. There's really nothing simpler than that. Um, but this idea of, of sort of sweets and home and cookbooks. Um, and this is one, I mean, some people say that the butter tart is the only truly Canadian recipe. I mean, Canadians might disagree with that 100%. But they say that this is the truly Canadian recipe and that Canada has the world's biggest sweet tooth because there are so many sweets um, from Canada and Canada has people, you know, from oh, it's such a multicultural country that there are, you know, these butter cakes that are can be a little, you know, have a French influence and a Scottish Scottish influence. There's also, you know, cardamom cakes. There's, you know, Greek baklava. There's Italian biscotti and gelato. And there's really, you know, Portuguese custards and Latin American, just everything basically from all over the world, but a lot of sweets, which I didn't really realize. But these particular um, butter charts, so we start seeing recipes in Canada in the 19th century, not recipes, but cookbooks, you know, published in Canada in the 19th century. And most of these had recipes for desserts, cakes, custards, you know, tarts, basically every sort of dessert, some with maple syrup, some with molasses, a lot of different fruits. But we start seeing this in the 19th century. And there was one published in 1854 called The Female Emigrant's Guide um, that was written by a woman named Catherine Parr Trail. She was an author. She was a botanist. She was really this groundbreaking, you know, woman that was describing, you know, the flora and fauna of, of Canada, of the climate. But she wrote a cookbook for immigrants. So every woman that was coming into the country that was moving into the country just so that they would have a guide so she includes recipes for apple pie including recipes uh, or not recipes but guides on planting an apple tree you know basically grafting planting harvesting drying basically doing everything with apples so she said that canada is the land of cakes and that canada is the land of sweets she doesn't have a recipe for butter tarts, but this is what she says in her cookbook. And this was a really groundbreaking cookbook and this whole idea of welcoming these women that are moving to Canada from different parts of the world, they're being welcomed through food, specifically through sweets. Um, so this is 1854. And then jumping a couple of decades to 1877, there's a cookbook called The Home Cookbook. Um, and this was... Canada's first community cookbook. Like this idea of community cookbooks is something that I've been obsessed with for a very long time. And it's something that um, reached Canada via the US. These books were really popular around the time of the Civil War. And it was a way for women to, before women could vote, women would get together, would collect recipes from their friends, from their relatives, and put them together and sell them to raise funds for a particular cause. Um, whether it's for, I don't know, a church group, a woman's group, a community group, whatever it is, but it's a way for women to basically have a voice through cooking, you know, through, through recipes. So the first one of these the Home Cookbook, um, and this was first published in 1877. By 1885, it had sold over 100,000 copies. So that's a lot of copies, um, considering the population of Canada, even though it's immense, just not that many people. So pretty much most women had, uh, actually not most, there were a lot more than 100,000 women in Canada at the time, but many of them had this particular cookbook um, and it most of the recipes were 
for desserts. Um, and they would, you know, sell ads. So, so uh, companies like, you know, baking powder companies and flour companies would basically advertise themselves in these magazines. And of course, these publications encouraged sweets so that they could sell ads. And so there was really a lot of, of sweets. Now, the first time that we see the butter cake recipe is in 1900. Um, so not that long ago. So one of these community cookbooks put together by the Women's Auxiliary, Auxiliary of the Victorian Hospital has the first butter tart recipe, but it's not called a butter tart. It's called a filling for a tart. Um, and this recipe was submitted by a woman named Mrs. May McLeod. So this is where we see this particular recipe for the first time, so 1900, and then the rest is history. And then we start seeing it all over in different forms, you know, in various recipes. So 1900 is when we see this first one, a filling for a tart by in a community cookbook. And then by 1911, we see the Canadian farm cookbook that has six different versions. Um, 1915, we have the five roses cookbook. And at that, by that point, um, 1915, it this particular Rose Five Roses cookbook considers it the only created in Canada dish, um, this particular butter dish. So it's very homey, it's sort of cozy. I mean, wheat was introduced into um, Canada in 1605. By the early 20th century, uh, Canadian wheat was winning awards, a gold medal awards for being the finest wheat, um, which is it's a very strong wheat because it's so cold. So it had been sort of, they, they came up with a particular type of wheat to withstand this cold um, and to make these sort of amazing uh, desserts. Oh, my, mm -hmm. it's over 25, to make these sort of amazing um, sweets. So I'm curious, before we start, you know, rolling out the dough and putting them together, Christy, tell us about your your butter tart. Like why, why this butter tart and what, what is it, what does it mean to you, this particular dessert? Well, when uh, we started the the business, we didn't actually bake ourselves. We actually outsourced um, the butter tart recipe. Well, first I asked my mom. I was like, "Mom, I'm not a baker." She taught me how to cook, but I I was never into baking. So I wanted to know, and I would eat all the desserts that my grandma my grandmother would make me, but I never really learned. Unfortunately, I wish I did, but I didn't. I was definitely more of a cook. So I asked her, did grandma ever have any butter tart recipes? And so she dug them up and she gave them to me. And I passed it along to a local business owner, Melanie Lino from Lit actually. And she started making our first butter tarts for us in the tent. Um, and it was a lot at once. It was, we were selling desserts and poutine and people were like, what is going on? Like, this is a lot of new stuff. So we kind of put a pause on the desserts and just focused on the food until we opened the restaurant. But that was one of the main reasons why we wanted the restaurant was so we could do more things. We could have different different um, types of food other than just poutine. So we do a lot more here now and the desserts are something that has become a regular thing. Um, we talked about Nanaimo bars that we've done as well. And um, we do like maple sugar cookies, um, mm -hmm. but um, the butter tarts are one of our best sellers. People love them. And um, it's a special recipe because it came from my grandmother. So yeah, <laughs> it's nice. I love that. I, I wonder if she has any of these cookbooks, you know, that, I mean, not obviously your grandmother wasn't born in the 19th century, but I wonder if they, you know, if, if there's any connection there to, to these, to these, you know, to these re original recipes. Sure. I would be curious to, to, you know, to know. It's so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm sure they're all over the place in like thrift stores too. I would be really interesting to find one one day. Absolutely, I go, yeah, completely. I'm obsessed with looking for cookbooks every time I I go to to bookstores. Yeah, I, I and I I was reading about these books. There, there are festivals um, in Ontario, which is where the, is that where you're from? From yep. that, that part of that this is where this this butter tart is is basically is, it's from and there are festivals like butter tart festivals yeah have you, been, have you ever been to a butter tart festival no i have not but i would <laughs> love to, to. Yeah, <laughs> I would love to. 
maple festivals we love maple syrup there's a ton of maple syrup festivals i've been to but never a butter tart one ah uh, maple syrup is the best I'm we'll talk to maple that. syrup when we, when we make the cocktail but yeah. that's awesome yeah. so now, your next your next trip has to be to the butter tart recipe yeah. um so i made the um i already made the the dough the, in advance which is um basically it's super super simple flour a little bit of shortening a little bit of butter some cold water and and I forget what else was in there a pinch of uh, and brown sugar and brown sugar like super 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 simple recipe um so I have it ready and some salt and I love a, a dough that's not very sweet I like that it has this this saltiness to it I was like, sort of eating little pieces of it um, which is really, really, which is really, really nice because I know that the filling is like super sweet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Kind so of, I have, sorry. It just kind of balances it out a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I'm excited about that. So I made, um, so I actually doubled the recipe just so that I could have a bunch. So this is these two little discs are actually two doubled the, the recipe. Um, so I'm going to, oh, Lisa's asking if you really need a food processor to mix it. Um, it does have the butter kind of get in, like break up the butter enough. I, but I think if, I mean, if you really mash the butter up, I guess, and work it, it should be fine. What do you think, Mai Tai? I think maybe if you have um, a pastry cutter, do you have a pastry cutter? Like uh, one of these, let me see. Um, where do I have one? I can show you. I have an extremely stupid question. Is this shortening? <laughs> Yep, that's the shortening. Thank you. No question is a stupid question, Ashley. <laughs> that's true. That's true. I, I am going to prove you wrong. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, Lisa, you yeah. So this is basically a pastry cutter. Um, so if you want to do this, or you could even maybe work really quickly, make sure that the shortening and the butter is really, really, really cold. Um, and then just working really quickly with the tips of your finger, just you you could break it up into so that it could look like P, like P. Um, I probably should have made it in class. I was concerned with timing, but I could probably whip up another batch together if that would be helpful. And is this already <laughs> measured to three fourths cup flour? No, there's definitely a little bit of extra in there. So I would still measure. Yeah. Thank you, Christy. Yep. <laughs> would it help to do a batch or should I just do, maybe just, I could, I'll just continue maybe. I just didn't already make the, uh, Okay. Oh, uh, someone says yes, do. I don't know. Yes, do. Okay. So let me, maybe what I'll do is just put these in the oven and then I'll make one just for, just for time. Um, and then it, it'll, it's, I can make it in like super quickly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, or maybe I, maybe, you know what, since it'll help, I'll just do it now. Is that okay? I think it'll, I think we'll have enough time. Yeah. So I'm going to super quickly do it. Let me stick this in the refrigerator really quick. So sorry, I probably should have before. Um, I didn't think. Okay, so I'm just gonna do it super quickly. Um, I'm gonna do it. I'm just gonna do it without a food processor for the, if those of you that don't have a food processor. I'll just do it super quickly. I'm gonna put this, flip this over so that you can see what I'm doing. Um, and and I would say at home, if if anybody has um, any kind of like little paper cups to put in the trays, um, like muffin, what would you call the muffin papers, <laughs> muffin cups, um, it helps with just like the okay, yeah <laughs> not a baker sorry yeah. <laughs> um so yes yeah, so it, it helps with like with the ingredients that are going into the tart are very sticky so if they if the dough cracks at all in the bottom or if it overflows like it will we'll talk about that when when my is filling the tarts sometimes if you fill it a little too high it will bake over so i recommend sometimes just having those those um, papers in the bottom um, when they when they're done you can just pop them out a lot easier and if there is any kind of like crack in the dough you're not like stick 
having a hard time getting the tart out and the tart's not going to break on you as you get it out, which we discussed wouldn't be the worst thing ever because you can just mm -hmm. scoop the whole thing out and still eat it and it's delicious and throw it on ice cream if that happens, but which will probably happen because that my desserts are always a disaster but <laughs> you know that it's okay it so i'm gonna make it i'm gonna make it super quick so i just me measured three fourths cup of flour um i'm gonna add a pinch of the brown sugar and two teaspoons of salt which which is which really cuts that whoops i just spilled a bunch of salt which really cuts the sweetness really nicely and I'm going to do a little more than two teaspoons of the stuff that I, whatever I spilled. So that's basically, I'm just mixing that really, really well. And then I'm going to add two tablespoons, I'm sorry, two teaspoons of very cold shortening, which is just Crisco. Um, so I'm just going to scoop two teaspoons onto here. Um, I just pulled, you saw that I just pulled this out of the refrigerator. So two teaspoons of shortening. And then I'm going to do two, um, two teaspoons and two tablespoons of butter. And so the good thing is that the butter is already, it's already measured. I think this is probably two, I think this is probably two teaspoons and two tablespoons. Is it okay if it's a little bit more? Probably okay, right? Yeah, a little more butter is not gonna. Yeah, I mean, a little, a little bit of butter, a little, more, a little extra butter didn't never kill them, no, but no, no, no. or maybe it did. But they're butter tarts. Come on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just bring on the butter. Fine. Okay, so I'm gonna cut this into small uh, little pieces. Just I want I'm gonna work really really quickly because I don't want to melt this. Yeah, I would say if you don't have the food processor, just try to get your butter like smaller, I guess, right away. Yeah. yeah that way, yes. that's really what it's just doing. It's just pulsing it all together and blending exactly. it better. So you can use your hands technically, it's just more work. It's just, yeah, I'm just doing it this way just in case. So I'm just gonna, if you see that I'm using my fingertips, my hands are always kind of hot. So, so just be, be, if you have, if your hands are, some people always have really cold hands and this, this is, that's being a baker is probably your dream job or the best job that you could have. But um, the one thing that you don't want to do is this. This is a disaster. You just want to sort of use your, your fingertips until, and really make sure that you get all of the flour. And, um, that you incorporate the, the butter and the shortening and all of the flour. Now, Christy, why both um, butter and shortening? Does it just make it, does the shortening just make it flakier? Yeah, um, I guess so. Yeah. I love that, um, I mean, shortening does make everything, the butter will gives it the flavor, right? And I think that the shortening gives it the, um, the oh. really nice, they're, they're just a really nice flakiness. Yeah. So I think that so looks pretty our, good. The one that we use in the restaurant actually is a gluten-free recipe. So you could make this a gluten-free recipe too. And I think I said, um, um, there's like a specific amount. We use like the Zyathin gum. Um, it just helps. We add a little bit of that to our gluten-free flour. If you are going that route, just because the it tends to, break apart a little easier so that mm -hmm. the, the dough together. Um, uh, I can't, I'm trying to see how much, I think it was like one tablespoon for every cup of flour. Um, okay. There's a, a couple of brands that are, I'm gonna add, um, so this is, um, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna just start adding the water. Um, so the table cut caused the recipe calls for anywhere between one and three tablespoons of ice water. I just put some water with ice in a mug here. And you could see how the dough, I don't know if you could see that it has sort of pea sized uh, pieces. Mm -hmm. And I just, there are some doughs that are sort of equal, all purpose, gluten free. Um, I just I I just use the the all purpose flour um, only because I didn't have any gluten free flour, um, but I'm gonna add so I'm gonna start with 
You might not need all of it. I'm going to start with two tablespoons and then just incorporate it. You want it really cold and then just mix it just until it forms a dough. You just want, don't want to over mix it because you want to make sure that the dough is still really, really, um, you don't want to overwork it because you'll overwork the gluten. You won't have, if you're working with gluten-free dough, you won't have this problem. Um, but you just want to, if you're working with regular dough like I am, the more that you work it, the more that you work the gluten and the tougher that it becomes. So I'm just going to work it until it forms a dough, which is coming. I'm going to add a teensy bit more. Just get it teensy, teensy bit more. And just so that there we have it. Super easy. It's just really, 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 really simple, um, simple dough. Um, so this, I'm going to grab the dough from the refrigerator only because I've been playing with this and it's going to be really hard to roll out. Um, so I'm just going to go back to my, to the fridge, but does anybody have any questions about about this dough here. Yeah, so how's mine looking? So I know it's a little crumbly, but I didn't want to work it too much. I am working with the flour I was given. Should it be, so the instructions I was given say, handle it only enough so the dough stays together, do not overwork the dough, but this is, this is too crumbly. I think as long as it comes to, just add, it in, I think you could stick your hands in there and just in, until it comes together. Did the kids have the gluten-free flour or the regular flour? Regular I flour. Regular, it's called regular flour. Oh, regular regular flour. Like, at the restaurant, we do ours gluten-free, but you can do it, at, like if you want to make them again, you can use gluten-free flour and then you would just need um, that zyathan gum. Oh, the phantom gum, right? Yeah. Okay. All right, I'm gonna start rolling these babies out. So I'm gonna leave, so this is the one that I made earlier. So you wanna, before you're rolling out, you wanna make sure that they're really nice and, and chilled. So Christy, what do you think? Like stick them in the, in the refrigerator for like 30 minutes before rolling them out, something like that? Yeah, yeah, usually I say the amount of time it takes you to make the filling then, that's usually enough time. Okay, perfect. So what I'm gonna do is first is roll it out and then put them in the molds and then refrigerate them while we make the filling. So I just lightly floured my workstation. And so how thin do I wanna make these? So this isn't a ton of dough. Like I said, you can go thin, but like, it depends on how, if you want a thicker crust, really, I guess it's your personal preference. I kind of, I like, I love dough. I love like the flakiness of it. Uh -huh. um, and then I also think it protects it a little bit more, especially, um, like I said, if you, sometimes if it overcooks, it's hard to get them out of the tin then. So if you have more dough, it's less likely that it's going to break on the bottom. Um, so like you could probably get, I would say you could probably get, and the nice part is you just kind of keep cutting and then you rework it again and cutting and rework it again. So like, you know what I mean? Yes. Your scratch, you're just going to keep re reusing. So do you want to think, is it like a quarter inch or is that too, is that too uh, thin? Maybe a little thinner, but not much. Yeah. Okay. So we want to make, did you say like four, like each recipe makes like four? I, it could, you could probably do six. Okay. You'd be surprised once you keep re reworking it. But, okay. Um, okay. So here is. Okay. So I have my um. And so uh, recipe calls for the the four inch tart. Mm -hmm. right? The four inch paper, and then I have one of these muffin tins. Yeah. So okay, I'm gonna roll out. Let me see, I'm just moving this over. 
You can keep uh, using flour, like as extra flour then as needed. Like if it's sticking, then just kind of use that to on your pin. Yeah. Okay. So let's see. So let me put these. And if folks don't have a cookie cutter, they can use like a bowl or a cup they have at home, right? That's about the same. Yep. So how, so does this look about right? Push 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 push. Push. And then you're just going to use your fingertips and gently kind of push the tart in. Yeah, it's beautiful. Is that too thick? Um, it's hard to tell on the video. You can maybe like do one like that and then try like going thinner with another one. Let's see. Okay. Oh my God, this I'm, I'm really excited right now. That looks beautiful. Thank you. All right, I'm going to do the, this other one that I had already sort of punched out. Yeah, and then it's, really, the other... it's up to you. Like once it's not going to be, it might, one will just be more doughy than the others, I guess. Okay, I love dough. Yeah, me too. <laughs> okay. All right, so I'm going to roll this out a little bit more. Okay. So I think, I wonder if just for time's sake, should I stop here? I could roll that this dough out for three more hours, but should I just stop here for time? What do you think, Stacey? We're going to go over time. Is that a problem? Yeah, we had we said we had till 8.15, so I think you're going okay. to on time. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So let me just roll out, you know, let me just finish this dough, if you don't mind. I think we're okay. How's everybody, those of you that are cooking along at home? You rolling out your, or, or your, is your dough still, is your dough rust or filling? I have I never know. been good at rolling out dough and it's going as it usually does. <laughs> good. Baking is hard. Baking is really hard. <laughs> it is so relaxing. Yeah. There's something I forgot. Oh, wait a minute. I'm teaching you to roll that. out this dough for, for like all evening. All right. If there is something nice about dough like it's very meditating like it, it's nice it really is dough. yeah meditative I, I I agree and my my grandmother was a baker I never you know she died when I was a baby but so but I don't know I feel like I channel my grandmother as you do with your butter tarts yes I love that all right I'm just gonna roll out one more I think that this dough these are really thick so yeah I think you're right it's like it's a it's a I could probably, I should have probably gotten sticks from this dough. You don't think that that you could get so much from I that? I know, it's surprising. Tiny piece. Yeah, it really stretches out. It's really, it's a really beautiful dough. I love it. It's so smooth. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm just going to stop right here at, I'm going to stop at five. Um, I have a little more batter, but I think. I think I'm just going to stop at five. I'm going to refrigerate this so that we could start making the um, the filling because it says, you know, uh, that you should refrigerate it so that it could be really, really nice and just cold when it goes into the oven. So let me go ahead and do that. Okay. Have you ever tried using these tarts for other types of filling? Um, using like the, the dough for the? For yeah. The dough? Have you ever used the cups to like put other things in? No, oh, but you could, I guess. It's just a basic dough, so you could really do anything. Yeah. Yeah, I know you can actually. Can you, yeah, you can. You, a lot of traditional recipes call for, you can add nuts or um, golden raisins. Uh for a nice touch, I think. Um, yeah. I love golden raisins. Yeah. I'm just gonna heat up um, half a stick, uh, I'm sorry, one stick, which is half a cup of butter. I'm gonna melt it right here in this little, in this little saucepan. And um, and then while that melts, just want this to melt and then cool. So I just cut the, the stick of butter in little pieces just so that it could cool a little bit faster. Um, I'm sorry, melt a little bit faster. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm going to make the filling. 
Um, so I'm going to flip this over again. So here I'm going to add a little bit of trash in here. Um, I'm going to beat two eggs. These are just kind of two large eggs. Maite, we have a question for you. Um, is there an advantage to using a saucepan for the butter over the microwave or can you melt the butter in the microwave? Um, the butter in the microwave is totally fine. Yeah, totally fine. I just thought to I'd do it this way just to get closer to everything. But so this is just a two eggs that I'm going to whisk. And then I'm going to add two cups of brown sugar. And my butter is almost ready. It's really nice and fast. Okay, uh, I'm gonna add two cups of brown sugar. It's a lot of brown sugar. <laughs> um, and a teaspoon of vanilla. And, and then to this, I'm gonna add my melted butter and the corn syrup. So it's a third of a cup of corn syrup. And, and um, Christy, I have dark corn syrup, um, but if you have light corn syrup, is that is that okay? That's totally fine, yeah. yeah. The brown sugar is gonna give it that color. The dark is nice, but We've done both, we've used both. It's you use both. Mm -hmm. So here's this, um, I'm gonna add third of a cup of- I'm sorry, um, so the small one is corn syrup and the big one is maple syrup? No, the, the big one's um, corn syrup and the small one's vanilla. Oh, okay. <laughs> sorry, can we please go back? So I just added, my daughter wants to show she's helping. Oh, so, excellent. Hi. We had beaten eggs to the brown sugar. I'm sorry, what's next? Um, you add beaten eggs and the corn syrup to the brown sugar. And this is the corn syrup and, and the beaten eggs. Okay. Yeah, and then you're gonna add the, the, the butter. You just need to be really careful with the butter because we have eggs in here. Oh, let me flip this over, sorry. Um, so I have the, the brown sugar and the corn syrup and the vanilla in here. Um, I'm gonna add the, the butter, but the butter is really, really hot. And the fear is that the eggs are gonna bake because of the hot butter. So ideally you would wanna cool the melted butter. Um, I have it right here in the saucepan. I'm just gonna pour it into a measuring cup and I'm gonna pour it a little bit at a time into, into, the, into the sugar mixture. Um, I feel like there's like a little delay on the camera, but I think that's okay. So I'm just gonna pour a little bit at a time to temper it so that I don't end up with scrambled eggs. Um, with sweet scrambled eggs. So ideally you would wanna cool it, but I'm just gonna add a little bit and then mix it really well. And then add a little bit more. Um, until when you feel that the bowl feels warm, then you can add the rest of it in there. But I'm just gonna do a little bit at a time just because I don't want to end up with scrambled eggs and I want to get these guys in the oven. Um, does anybody have any questions as I, as I do this? Okay. I love the color. I love this, um, this brown. Oh my gosh. This is basically like, it reminds me of um, pecan pie filling. It's mm -hmm. very similar, right? You could make, basically use the same. I think next Thanksgiving, I'm gonna use this batter to make, um, to make my pecan pies. All right, let me do a little what bit. This? That should have gone in the dough. 
<laughs> oh, um, what was it? It's um, salt and brown sugar, like a pinch of salt and pinch of brown. Oh, sugar. got it. Thanks. Probably be fine. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to add the rest of my butter. And it's a pretty thick, um, a pretty thick uh, batter. Pretty yeah. thick. Oh, yeah, it's thick. Wow. Mm -hmm. You get oh your gosh. workout before you eat your sweets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love this. I love this. I can't. Oh my god, that's delicious! Right. It's like caramel. It's like caramel. Yes, it's so good. Yeah. So good. All right, so I'm gonna go get the tarts from the refrigerator. So how much do I want to? add so this is where it gets um tricky you want to you want to fill them but you don't want to fill them to the tippy top okay so i would leave like a maybe a quarter inch oh well okay that because they're gonna puff up in the oven okay and then they're gonna sink back down again like once they're like cooled and baked but in the oven they, they puff up and if they bake oh over if they like start to overflow now you have a really nice like rim crust there so like that's going to catch it so you can go like maybe a like a little bit more but okay. um uh depending on what like your tray looks like um and if you don't have like the edges kind of of the dough nicely a little bit over where like the edge of the actual um muffin tin is then it you know what i'm saying like sometimes it can it can bake over and then uh -huh. it'll stick and that's when it gets a little sticky and tricky to get them out and you just want to eat them and you're like these look so good and then you're just okay. trying to get them out and they're falling apart so that's what i say just just be that look pretty good? yeah that looks great okay yeah it's hard to tell from like an aerial aerial view but like yeah um do you think I could go a little bit more or do you think yeah. I should? Just... I think you can go a tiny bit more. I'm always like on the edge of it because I'm like, ooh, I want more filling. But then I'm always like, ooh, it, there it goes. It's baking over again. Oh, uh, yeah, it's getting <laughs> stuck. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna do a little bit more just to, just because um, this, this filling is so good. Yeah, and then you did make it kind of like a thicker crust. So I think it'll hold up pretty good, but. Maybe, okay, okay. All right, perfect. Well, let's see. These are going to go in the oven. And I'm going to put this, set this aside. And then we'll make our cocktail. Mm. <laughs> All right. So, oops. So, I should put this in. Um, let me see. How are we doing on time? So, so should I should check them, put them in for 10 minutes at 425. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, put 10, 10 minutes. Okay. And then. I think it should be okay. Maybe if we put them a little bit under, just so that we have 15 minutes left. But I think we'll, we'll, we'll I think we'll, I think we'll be ready. Yeah. Um, so we have. Um, so while that's in the oven, um, we're gonna make our cocktail um, or mocktail for those of you that are that are making a mocktail with with tea. Um, but this is an old fashioned with Canadian whiskey. Um, and I love that where well, I didn't realize this, the Canadian whiskey um, doesn't have an E. It, it's a whiskey without an E. It's it's spelled without an E. Um, but it is, um, you know, it's we, we actually the first whiskey distillery, legal whiskey distillery, opened in Canada in 1832. And so this was, you know, quite popular. A lot of Scottish immigrants, you know, early on or Scottish, you know, settlers, um, they arrived in Canada. There was no barley in Canada, but there was plenty of wheat. Um, so they started making the whiskey rather than Scotch whiskey that has that is with barley, making it with a combination of corn and rye mash. Um, and Scottish, uh, sorry, Canadian whiskey is much lighter and smoother than Scottish whiskey or than Scotch 
or even then, you know, American bourbon or, or anything like that. It's very, very light and it's very, very smooth and it's very, very flavorful. It's the rye that gives it the, the flavor. Um, so we're making an old fashioned, which is a classic American cocktail. So this is like the artist. It's like the, the America and you know, the US and, and Canada. Um, and this is one of the, it's actually considered uh, the US's first mixed drink. Um, the first recipe for the old fashioned. Um, it was called a whiskey cocktail and it appears in the first cocktail book by a man named Jerry Thomas. Um, he was American from New York and he wrote this book called um, The Bartender's Guide or How to Mix Drinks. Um, and this was 18, 1862. Um, How to Mix Drinks or the Bon Vivant's Companion. Um, and it used to be called a whiskey cocktail. Um, so we're doing a sort of Canadian inspired version rather than using sugar or simple syrup, uh, using maple syrup. Um, so this is a drink that, it's a mixed drink, or there's a butter in my glass, mixed drink that has, um, that, that's sort of made in the drink, in the cup that you're drinking it from, rather than on a cocktail, you know, shaker and then poured, everything's made in the same cup. Um, so I'm going to, can everybody see, maybe not, um, so it's basically, it's two ounces of whiskey. So I'm doing two ounces of, of Canadian whiskey. And I, and it is much lighter in color. I mean, it's, it's a very, very light um, caramel color. It kind of looks like the color of the butter tart. So I'm doing two ounces. I should probably dump all of this. No, this is probably an extra two ounces. I was gonna say, I'll dump it all in there, but maybe not. Um, then we're doing uh, about a quarter ounce of maple syrup. Um, maple syrup is the sort of quintessential Canadian, you know, what do you got? Crop or not? Not crop. Sort of, you know, ingredient product. Um, and this is a syrup made from the maple tree. Um, and this is something that the people in, you know, Native Americans in Canada, the First Nations, Iroquois, they have been making maple syrup for about 9,000 years in Canada. This particular uh, maple syrup is from Whole Foods, and it's actually made mixture of U.S. and Canadian maple syrup. So it's probably Vermont and Canadian uh, maple syrup. It's probably, it's, it's a mix. It's not pure. Um, but this is something that, you know, it was made uh, for thousands of years, um, they would have the, the First Nations would have a festival called this Sugar Moon, uh, the first full moon of spring. They would get together and uh, make sort of a, an incision in the maple tree, like a V in the maple tree, tree and then the sap um, would, would sort of come out of the tree, it was then collected and boiled. And this syrup, you know, for thousands of years was used to preserve meats, to flavor meats, um, and also used medicinally as an antiseptic, also used to treat, you know, heart conditions and, you know, kidney, liver, you know, issues. So it was used medicinally and it was just, you know, such an important uh, product of, of the, you know, this, this, this region. Um, so it's, it's really quite, you know, in incredible. And it's very cool because the sort of syrup, it's, it's made from the sap of this tree. Um, and sorry, I have to look at my notes here, because this is something that I just learned, that trees, they store starch in their trunks and their roots before the winter. And then this starch is converted to sugar that rises um, in the winter and late spring. And this is when the, the trees are, are, are tapped. Um, so the settlers, they just sort of, you know, European settlers, they just love this and sort of it became a huge industry. And now um, three fourths of the world's supply of maple syrup comes from Quebec in you know Canada. So it's pretty amazing how little simple syrup on your waffles in the morning has such a long and amazing history. Um, so I'm just gonna add a quarter ounce, just a little bit of maple syrup to the whiskey, um, a little bit of bitter, bitters. This is Angostura bitters. It's the sort of classic, you know, cocktail uh, seasoning, if you will. Just gonna add a couple of dashes to that. 
Um, I'm going to give it a nice mix. Sort of should I use um, just gonna give it a mix um, just until the syrup dissolves. And gonna add some ice, bring it over here, add some ice. And garnish it with little orange peel, just enough peel so that it doesn't have any of the pith. It's not really bitter. I'm just gonna twist it over, let some of the little oils just dance into the drink and Cheers, everybody. Whoever is making a, a sort of mocktail, you could do exactly the same thing, um, but using a black tea um, and like a, just a black tea you could use, or you could even use a barley tea, um, which would be kind of nice and have that grain element to it. If you don't have barley tea, um, you could just use like a, a just a generic black tea. Cheers. I love a good old fashioned. Mm -hmm. It's my favorite. Um, if it's not tequila, it's an old fashioned for me. Um, so I have two minutes. Um, so it's 10 minutes at 425 and I'm just going to lower the heat to 350 and do another 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, are they starting to pop up a little bit? Yes. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Good. They are and they have little bubbles in there. Thanks. Yeah. You think it, it's okay to lower the heat a little bit to, to 350 now? Yeah, you can probably yeah. do it. Just trying to be conscious of time. Um, let me see. I grew up going to many, many uh, maple syrup farms and learning all about that process and seeing oh, wow. all the trees tapped and um, the process of like boiling it down and the different colors, like the amber ones, the lighter, the darker. And there's really like nothing like a good Canadian maple syrup like it's it's like nothing else it's the um, flavor of it you know it's it's different than just like sh sugar forward like but normally you would put on your pancakes it's it's like there's more to it there's it's it's sap like it's it's delicious it's yeah it's yeah it's it's incredible <laughs> I, and I love this whole thing it's, yeah just that it comes from the tree and that it boils and it's just it, and it's still so close to its origin right the, mm -hmm. the true maple syrup it's it's so it's like, it. yeah it's it's so good yeah. you could taste the the earth the, the yeah. green the, yeah it's so <laughs> cool. so cool. i would love to see that yeah back home they, they would in the winter time they'll they'll um they'll take it like a big trough and there's always snow so there's a ton of snow in this trough and then they'll take hot maple syrup and just pour it on to the snow and then popsicle sticks will like they'll roll it because it immediately freezes into like a little sugar popsicle thing so then you just kind of like roll it into it and then you'd hand them out to all the kids and the kids are going crazy They're, it's so good so I always want to do it here in the winter but we haven't done it yet so we oh my gosh that is so cool yeah yeah that's amazing I have to go to Canada I've never been to Canada, but now that's all I, 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 I want to go. Yeah, I'm missing out. I'm missing out. There's so much. I made my daughter a um, virgin uh, mocktail with um, some Sleepy Time Mint, uh, maple syrup, and orange juice. So I really simplified it. I didn't have bitters, but she really likes it. Oh, excellent. I'm so glad. I remember last time you made a lemonade when we made margaritas, right? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's ready to be uh, turned down to 350. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Mine, um, I have about eight more minutes. Um, oh, you, Eileen, you learned about the snow and maple syrup and, and, and Laura Engelwelder's books. That's so cool. Yeah. It's, it's, it's such a cool experience. That is very, that is amazing. Amazing. Oh gosh, does anybody have any any questions um, for for us? For any for oh Elise, hey Elise, um, that's so cool. I'm missing out. I must have missed that when I was a kid re reading that. It's definitely memorable. 
I just want to say I mentioned this today to my class. I teach um, a first year writing class and I had a student from Pakistan. And when he heard that it was from the Flying V, he said, oh, you're probably making poutine. So <laughs> he knows you, like you're, you're known. That's it's really awesome. cool. Wow. That a Pakistani student anticipates Canadian cuisine. Yay. <laughs> it's so cool. Like that's, I'm telling you, that's the coolest part about this whole thing is just like educating a completely new community on a, a food that no one's ever heard of before and like it's comfort food too so it's even better you know bring people together um and just what's better than that like eating and drinking and meeting new people and getting to know people and enjoying good food and it's all that's great I love that great I love that and I love that you started it because you were missing home and now you've created this this community you know, the, which is fantastic. How long, um, how long, when did you start? How long have you been doing it? Um, 2017 was our first event in, in the tent and it was outside of a brewery. Um, yeah, so not that long. I mean, I mean, yeah, it's getting there, but it's still pretty new. And our goal, we have pretty big goals to grow and expand. Lily Have Alley knows us now. And we, um, we what used to go to New York City every Saturday. We were smorgasbord vendors. So that's one of the biggest open air food festivals in the country. Um, so that's when um, the Consulate General of Canada recognized that we were bringing poutine to New York City and nominated me as an influential Canadian uh, uh, in New York because like no one was really doing that there. So it's, it's, it's crazy to think about, you know, like bringing like a taco or like a I don't know, like a burger somewhere for the first time, <laughs> but um, yeah, it's, it's awesome. That is awesome. Congratulations. That's, a, that's so cool. Yeah. yeah. So um, we want to keep going. We want to, we want to expand. We want to have poutine known and butter tarts known like everywhere in the country, you know, and like all over. So we'll get there, but yeah, it's been question. Good. Are the poutines, is it just a sweet, um, dish or are there other variations of poutine that are oh it's all savory there's we don't do any sweet ones really um I guess you could we've talked about doing like a churro version as for fries instead and like maybe um instead of cheese curds it would be like marshmallows and like a some kind of chocolate sauce instead of gravy <laughs> But, um, but I know I've heard of I know I've heard of it. I'm like I don't remember it being sweet. So no, that, no, that this was, is, was so interesting when I got the packet. I'm like, oh, I didn't expect it. We weren't really sure how to do that. I wasn't sure how to do like poutine right. in a packet, other than you know you could fry potatoes at home. If I gave you potatoes, the gravy is a top secret recipe, so I can't give that out. That's like that's our thing. But um, and then to package the gravy, it's all made fresh. So it would have to be refrigerated if they just gave you the gravy and the cheese curds. And then you're really not making anything other than chopping potatoes up and like frying them and assembling the cheese and the gravy. So it was, I wasn't sure how we were gonna do that. So we decided to go with the, with the dessert instead, but yeah. And Christy, you mentioned that when we met with you that there were only so many restaurants in the United States that even offer poutine and you're one of how many? I would say restaurants are putting it on their menu now. So it's tough to say how many restaurants have it as just like an option. Some people, that's not their thing though, but to be an actual like poutinerie um, that they focus just on making poutine, I, there's maybe five or six in the country. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, there's not many. It's awesome. The first time I tried it was at Music Fest, which was the perfect combination of working a 12 hour shift and then eating the poutine to oh, yeah. revive me. Yeah, it was amazing. <laughs> I've never had it. I need to, I need to come. Oh yeah. Yes, yeah, so I'll be happy to take you. <laughs> Thank you. We had a couple of questions for you in the chat. Um, can you substitute the corn syrup? Is there anything that would suffice for that? I wonder if maple syrup would be okay, um, but I don't know. Like I said, not a bake. I feel like this is why I'm a bad baker because I'm like, it's probably fine. Like, cause in cooking you can do that, but the science of that, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Substitute the corn syrup. I wonder if the corn, if the maple syrup is so much more liquid than the corn syrup is much denser. I wonder if it yeah. would just it might be too runny 
I think Maybe. It because that's kind of the problem, not the problem, but people prefer butter tarts a lot of different ways. And depending on the recipe, sometimes the filling can be more like dense and thick and sometimes it'll, it'll be really runny. So as soon as you like bite into it or like cut into it, it'll kind of spill out everywhere. It can be a little messy, mm -hmm. it's just personal preference. So like, I think if you, if you didn't use the corn syrup and you did something more runny like that, it would just be more, more runny even inside. I wonder if you could just skip it all together and just do the, the brown sugar and the egg and the butter. Yeah, it might get a little, maybe, yeah, maybe just less, maybe like a little bit of like maple syrup, some kind of syrup, just maybe. not as much. Just I to a, give it something. I had a friend text me that um, maybe honey. Yeah, because honey is pretty thick too. Yeah, could try that. Um, if you have more filling than pea, yeah, there's definitely going to be more filling. I did notice that when we were testing because we cut the recipe down for the kits. So I noticed there was a little bit more filling. Um, um, it should say there's, there's eggs in it. So I would say maybe like three or four days in the fridge to save the yeah. filling. Or you can always just make, more. Yeah. make a, make, make a bunch. You could probably just make them and make the tarts and freeze them once they're cool. They probably will. They probably freeze really well. well they freeze really well. Yeah. I sometimes I just eat them frozen. So like we'll have extras and I'll just, it's almost like a Snickers bar then because the pastry is so like flaky and it's that when it, even when eating that frozen, it's just eating a cold basically. And the inside, it's kind of like the, the gooeyness that normally is there. Like it's Snickersy, where like it kind of like streams out on you. It's really good cold, actually. <laughs> that sounds delicious. Well, let me show you. I just pulled these out of the oven, and I think that they definitely overflowed. Oh and my my daughter, <laughs> Look, see what I mean? Fill more, fill more. <laughs> no, that's totally fine. This is how this is how I learn, and luckily I have a lot of batter. So I think that I probably my batter is a little bit big. Oh, these actually are probably are okay. Um, I'm going to scoop these out. Oh, what should I use? Like maybe use a spoon or a spatula? So I like to kind of like use a knife a little bit or something to cut the edges first. Because okay. it's it'll get them. And then you just have to be really careful. Because it's so, it's basically just sugar. Right. Look how beautiful this looks. Can you see that? Oh, okay. So I'm just going to scoop this out. Yeah, your other ones are probably pretty good. And I would like with time, you're gonna scoop them out now, but I would generally let them cool before you take them out anyways, okay. because then it'll just, they'll hold their shape a little bit better. But, uh, but oh yeah, they're good, perfect. Look at that. That looks really good, that looks amazing. And it came out, it, it, it scooped out really well. This one, I think I'm gonna stick back in the oven because the, 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 this one, this one is with the filling was sort of perfect in this one. Yeah, that one looks great. I think I'm going to stick these back in the oven, though, because the batter of those looks a little bit, looks just a little too light. But I want to taste this, this one that I did pull out. Well, these go back in the oven for a little longer. But this looks amazing. This looks like every picture that I, it looks like every picture that I saw of butter tarts. Mm -hmm. I'm very impressed. I have to say thank you for your recipe. Yeah. Amazing. Let me use this spoon to, so can everybody see? I'm just sort of. Oh yeah, that ooey. Yeah, I do, how'd I do? How'd I do, Christy? That looks great. That looks perfect. It looks so good. I feel like if I put this in my mouth right now, I'm gonna burn. Yeah, you might, but. <laughs> burn myself. Worth it. Make sure that cocktail's nearby if you need yeah. it. <laughs> it really looks so good. I have to taste this though. It smells incredible. Oh, yeah. Mmm. <laughs> that is really delicious. It's basically like a pecan pie, like the best part of a pecan pie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the, oh my God, it's amazing. Thank you. We yeah. Use the, use the, like we use the leftover, um, like, you know, if we don't sell them, we'll like, we'll freeze them um, or we'll put them on ice cream then too. So they're really good on ice cream. And then the, you can keep them at room temperature on your counter and eat them for breakfast with coffee or tea. They're delicious in the morning. And then 
if you would like to nuke them in the oven too and like just heat them up a little bit again, you can, people like to do that, but you don't have to. Um, but warm over ice cream is really good, vanilla ice cream. Mm. Amazing, that's dinner. This is dinner for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, this has been such a wonderful program. Thank you everyone for sticking with us and for trying out the recipe. If you try it, please make sure you take a picture and tag us so you can win a gift certificate to the Flying V. Um, thank you, Maite, and thank you, Christy, so much for this wonderful program. And Alicia, thank you as well. Uh, we have the recipe card on our website. We still have plenty of Taste of Art kits available for pickup, so we'd love for you to try this at home. And make sure you go to the Flying Bee and try the poutine, that's for sure, and then follow it up with the butter chart. But thank you all for being here. We appreciate your time, and I hope you have a great evening. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. Bye. Thank you. Good night. Bye.